I trust your day has been as enjoyable as mine has been. I've spent the day with two good men that I appreciate and enjoyed their company. I enjoyed the activity of the day, but I especially enjoyed the news of the day of hearing young Sister Smith obeying the gospel. That's, you, you just can't get better news than to hear that someone has obeyed what God has said for us to do. And that's uh, that's a marvelous, marvelous thing. Glad to, to see, glad to see you here tonight. Sorry about the snow. I had no intentions of bringing it. I blame Bud. And the reason I do is because he told us. He says it says it's going to snow, and it just didn't look it at all. The sun was shining. It was a little bit warm for a while while we were. It turned into the Arctic Circle by five o'clock, but uh, it's snowing. And so I I believe Bud. You know that's just it. But we're glad you're here. Please open your Bibles to the fifth chapter of the book of Acts. And let's look at a true story, an occasion that happened with the apostles, and a confrontation about their teaching the truth of God's Word. It's amazing when you look in the Bible and read it as it needs to be read and study as it, need, as it needs to be studied. It's amazing to see how people near 2,000 years ago have the same mentality we got today. And every once in a while, you find an individual who's not a member of the Lord's kingdom, not a member of the church, but he's got a smart statement that's right. Let's read. They had brought the apostles to them, that is, the magistrates had brought the apostles to them, and set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name, the name of Jesus? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now before we go farther, let's understand who the pronouns are referring to. This man is Jesus. And the ones that were claiming that the apostles were trying to bring the guilt of his death upon them are the magistrates of the Jewish council, thus the hierarchy of the Jews, who had cried aloud not many days before, crucify him. Now hear it. His blood be on us and our children. They asked for that accusation. They wanted Christ dead. They wanted his blood to be spilled. Jesus fooled them. He didn't spill it. He shed it. You know the difference in that? To spill blood, you don't give it willingly. You spill blood when you butcher a hog or a beef. I'm sorry about that, patience, but that's how it happens. You shed blood when you give it willingly, knowing what they're going to do to you and understanding they don't know why you're shedding blood, but your heavenly Father knows. And those that will listen, learn, and obey will learn that it was shed, not spilled. You're trying to put this man's death on us. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Yeah, we've got to blame you for it. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Spirit, whom God gave to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Now let's take note there before we continue farther. Twice in the New Testament, actually in the book of Acts, you'll find the second one in the seventh chapter of Acts in about verse 54. Twice you will find the phrase, they were cut to the heart. 
It is each time after the gospel has been preached to them, and that's precisely what Peter preaches to them between verses 29 and 32. You killed him. He was buried. God rose, raised him from the dead. That's the gospel. When Stephen preached that gospel to the Jewish council, they too were cut to the heart. Now contrast that with Acts chapter 2 and look at verse 36. At Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, the writing reads, that Peter says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Did you see the difference between being pricked in the heart and cut to the heart? Being pricked in the heart means that you let that two-edged sword come right straight to the point. Being cut to the heart means you flinched at the truth and it sliced you like you should have been. Now that's a kind of a redneck definition, but you get the understanding, don't you? Neither did these Jewish councils, nor the one to which Stephen preached, neither of these magistrates and councils wanted the truth. It angered them. The truth was the same both at, or all three times, at Pentecost, here, and in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen's preaching. The truth is exactly the same. In fact, when you look at the sermons, they are the same. Same context, same purpose. One group receives it with gladness and obey the gospel. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. You remember that in Acts 2. Here, instead of receiving the truth, they're angered by it. They don't want this truth. In Stephen's situation, so angered by it were they that without legislation and law, they take Stephen outside the city and stone him to death. They should have been arrested by their own law for murder. Now watch what happens to this Jewish council. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the nitpickers, I guess you'd say, of the law. They wanted everything just right by their interpretation. They were very legalistic, commanding ties that God did not command, commanding ordinances that God did not command, such as washing your hands before ye. Well, one of those Pharisees named Gamaliel a doctor of the law, that doesn't mean that he had his Ph.D. in the law of Moses. That simply means that he was a skilled scholar of the law. He stood up in the midst of them. He had a great reputation among the people and commanded to put forth the apostles a little space. Let's, let's back off of this a minute. He said to them, you men of Israel, that now he's talking to the council, Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do is touching these men. That's wise advice. Before these days rose up Thaddeus, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to nothing. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee, not Judas Iscariot, or Judas that was called Thaddeus. This is a completely different Judas. In the days of the taxing, he drew away much people after him. He perished, and all, even as many as had obeyed him, were dispersed. They scattered around. And now I say to you, refrain. In other words, stop it. This is the end of it. That's, you read Psalms and they'll say refrain doesn't mean avoid, it means you're coming to the end of this. Let's just stop this. This is the end of it. 
refrain from what refrain from these men let them alone if this counsel or this work be of men it'll come to nothing but if it be of God you cannot overthrow it lest happily you be found even to fight against God we're coming right back to that to Gamaliel they all agreed and when they had called the apostles and beaten them well, they agreed with Gamaliel, but they thought they'd add an extra punch, literally. And beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let him go. The apostles departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. Praise be for those apostles. Some of us would just lay down and say, I'm it, I'm done, I'm done. You know, this hurts. Well, let it hurt. I can tell you stories of what's happened to me in my life. Jared can tell you some stories. He's, he's got a long way to go yet in his life of preaching, but there'll be stories. I keep a file at home. My wife and kids wonder why I keep it. I think I keep it there just to remind myself that I am human. I call it fan mail. <laughs> My wife wants to fan the flames with it. It's unsigned letters accusing me of things that no one can prove, things that I didn't do. They're hateful, they're vicious, but they're allowing somebody to vent their spleen and I kind of figure if it made them feel better, okay, I did some good after all, you know. I've had my car wrecked by another member of the church who denied that he did it. And my paint was on his car and his car paint on mine, but he denied it. I've had threatening phone calls. Yeah, I've had a guy get in my face a time or two. It's okay. They haven't crucified me yet. And until they start coming after me with swords and stays, and nails in one hand, a hammer in another, and a cross that I'm going to have to carry literally, I'm not going to worry too much about it. And even if that happens, so what? How about any of us? All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You willing? Now the other side of that statement is a question. If you're not suffering persecution, just how godly are you? See, that's in there too. Well, let's come back to the point. Gamaliel was a wise man. If it be of God, you can't change it. You can't overthrow it. You can't get rid of it. You can't change it. Because if you try... You'll be found to fight against God. When did God ever lose? Tell me any battle that God lost. Tell me any argument that God lost. Tell me any situation where God had to apologize because he found out he was wrong. Now don't you see, Gamaliel's right. He may not have been a Christian. I don't know whether this ever became a Christian, rather. I don't know whether this is the same Gamaliel that taught the Apostle Paul. I have no idea. It might have been. The man, however, and whoever he was, was a smart man. If this idea, if this counsel, if this doctrine, if it's of man, it's going to come to nothing. It's going to go away. It, it won't exist after a while. Give it time. Don't worry about it. But if it's of God, you better quit fighting it anyway because you're not going to win this battle. Just give it time to see. So let's test a few things tonight and see. Can we suggest tonight that if it be of God, Jesus Christ is of God? John says at, John, at, 1, John, uh, at, at 1 John chapter 4, well, let's go first here. Let's go to John chapter 1. And notice at verse 1. If, uh, I, you know what, Chuck? 
I may have told you the wrong slide because while that's true, that's not matching my outline. Christ of God, here it is, here it is, my fault. I don't count well. All right. If it's of God, we can ask, is Christ of God? Well, let's see. Let's go ahead and finish that one while we had it up here. At John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. Notice the capital W. The Word, capital W, was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now that makes at least two unless you want to play the schizophrenic game. With God. Okay? All things were created by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That helps me understand Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. I don't have any problem saying that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Matthew chapter 3 proves it. Jesus is standing in the water. The Spirit of God descends upon him in a form like as a dove. And the voice says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, unless you're looking at that old comical song about I'm my own grandpa, you're going to have a problem telling me that there's only one in God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. There's three. There's three beings there. But he's got a right to the name God. How is that, preacher? Very simple. There's Davis the dad, Jeremy the son, Parker the grandson. Now, if you saw pictures of my son and my grandson, you'd agree with my wife that she's got small, medium, and large of the same thing. We all got named Davis. There's Davis the Mike, Davis the Jeremy, Davis the Parker. What's the common ground? That family name. You got God the Father, you got God the Son, God the Spirit. What's the common ground? The name. What's better about it is they all agree. What's better about it, they all designed an eternal plan and they all fit their special parts to the plan. What's better about it is they shared the plan with, that, with us. What's better than that is that they let us obey it. Like our young sister did this afternoon. That's what it's about. Obey the truth. Obey the truth. But let's ask again tonight. If it be of God, did you notice it will defy man's wisdom? At 1 John chapter 4, and that's when I first found out I had the wrong slide up there. I apologize for that. At 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, John writes, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Hereby know we the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof we, have heard it, the, whereof we have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. Why? Because man's wisdom doesn't equal God. Isaiah spoke about it in the 55th chapter of his book. Actually, it's God doing the speaking. And God says, My ways are not your ways. Let's just go back and get it exactly. Beginning at verse 6 of the 55th chapter, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, 
As the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but waters the earth and make it, makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that to which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. And ye shall go forth with joy, and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Even nature will recognize God. Why can't man? Why can't we understand? God is. And if it is of God, it will absolutely defy the wisdom of man. It will defy it. Therefore, Jesus said at Matthew 11, verses 28 to 39, You come to me. You understand that I'm the wise one. I'm the being that you need to learn from, gain from, and absorb within your life. He says it in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You'll find rest to your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. That should be verse 39, 39. You understand then, if it is of man, it won't profit you. But if it be of God, you can't change against it. Paul mentions that to Corinth. When he says to Corinth, this is the reason we've preached the gospel to you. Notice beginning, we'll, we'll not take the time tonight to read the entirety of that first chapter as I've listed here, well, nearly the entirety of it. But let me, let me just pick a few verses and you read in between here. Beginning at verse 18, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Did you hear that? To them that perish, it is foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Look again now, if you will, at, verses 20, at verse 23 beginning. We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. My brethren and friends, you can't get better than God. Who else could have created the world? Who else could have designed a plan of salvation? Who else? would be willing enough to sacrifice His only begotten Son in our behalf. Who else could have designed a kingdom that is eternal and call it the church and an entrance that is so simple to obey and so secure to stay within? If it be of God, it will save the soul. The gospel of Christ was designed just for that purpose. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, said Paul. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why, Paul? For therein, inside this gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. There's been all kinds of sermons written and preached about that phrase, from faith to faith. Let me give you a very minuscule idea of that meaning, but I believe a very important meaning of it. You can't obey the gospel without having faith. How did you get it? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. From faith, that's where you started. To faith. Well, I've already got that. No, to faith. What kind of faith increased? What has to increase with it? Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Or, yeah, 2 Peter chapter 1. God, according to His divine power, hath given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. 
Now he says, okay, what do you do with that? He says, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Pretty well does away with the doctrine of faith only, doesn't it? Pretty well does away with it. Had a neighbor when I lived down in southeastern Ohio. He believed that we're saved by faith only, nothing else. Well, one winter, about like we've had this past winter, there was just all kinds of snow around Summerfield. And old Charlie and I, being the youngest in that area, decided it was our duty to shovel everybody out. So we got busy, and then we got tired, we got wet, and we got cold. Charlie came over to my front porch and sat down, and my wife brought us out coffee or hot chocolate or something to warm us up. And Charlie and I become good friends, good neighbors. And I said, Charlie, got to ask you something. I said, are you absolutely sure that you're saved by faith only? Absolutely, Mike. I'm absolutely sure of that. Well, I pulled out my New Testament that I try to carry with me about everywhere I go. And I said, Charlie, can I read something to you? Sure. So I read 2 Peter chapter 1, whereby giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. Let these things be in you and abound. He that diligently does these things shall, have a crown, uh, shall enter into eternal life and all that it says in it. Now I said, Charlie, what did Peter mean when he said, add to your faith? He sat there for a little while and he says, well, those are all components of faith. Oh, they are? So you get them when you have faith? Yeah, I said, I still don't know then what that word add means. What's that mean? If those are already components of faith, add to your faith. And I've already got it. Oh, well, he says they're Christian graces. Oh, my. I said, Charlie, I'm really confused then. I said, if these are Christian graces, why did Peter tell me I have to diligently add them? That means work to me. And he thought a little bit, and he says, Mike, nobody's ever talked to me this way about that. We spent the next hour or so discussing adding to your faith. Never had to go to James and show him that, by, that faith only is dead being alone. Never had to do that. Just stick with the facts. Add to your faith. What's that mean? He wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with that. A couple of weeks later, on a Sunday morning, still snow on the ground, terrible snow, and bad and all. Poor Charlie, if ever there was a bad luck Charlie, it was him. His car just would not start. There wasn't anything about it that would start. And having been a mechanic for a little bit, I went over and looked at it, and I found out that the points in his distributor, and you young folks don't know anything about those things. That was back on, like, Model T's and A's and back. And... Uh, that the points in his uh, distributor were non-existent. He, they just plain burned up. He didn't have any other way to get to where his obligation of preaching, in quotes, was. So I said, Charlie, I don't believe a word of your doctrine, and you know that. But I said, I do believe that a man has to do what a man has to do. So I said, you take my car, and you go on over there. But I said, I, I, I want to remind you, I still want an answer to what Peter meant when he said, add to your faith. I, I'm still worried about that. If you're right, then I'm wrong. I've got to change my mind. Okay. Well, he took my car and went over to a little place called Whigville and did his preaching. You would be surprised how many people on the way to Summerfield said, what's Mike doing over there in Whigville? You know, they saw the car. Charlie came back that afternoon. His wife got out of my car and slammed the door to where I thought every piece of glass in the car was going to shatter. And Charlie came over in a little bit with the keys, and he's crying. Charlie, what's the matter? Something happened again? Yeah. What? I got fired. Oh, Charlie, you've lost your job? Mm-hmm. And he said, I think I'm going to lose my wife over it, too. She's as mad at me as anybody could ever be. Well, what in the world happened? He said, for the first time in my life, I owned up to the truth that you cannot be saved by faith only. And I preached that sermon from 2 Peter chapter 1. And they fired me. I have no clue where Charlie is anymore. I've always wondered if he ever obeyed the gospel after that. 
I have no clue whether or not his marriage held up after that. I, I just don't know. They left within a week after that. I don't know where they went. Don't know anything about it. <coughs> but I tell you, brethren, when, you impl- when simply you sit down with a fellow and you show him that if it be of God, you can't fight against it lest you be overthrown. I tell you, that will save your soul too. That's why it's His power, His wisdom. That's why faith comes by listening to Him. That's why without faith it's impossible to please God. That's why this faith is undefeated in any challenge. That's why this faith grants an uncompromising knowledge of God's existence in all of our lives. That's why, brethren and friends, it is established with better promises upon a better covenant with a better priest It's all in Christ Jesus, my friends. Therefore, this salvation granted by Christ creates a new life in us, one intent on eternal life. If it be of God, you cannot overthrow this. You can't change it. Man's doctrine changes every day. For nearly 2,000 years, this doctrine has stood sure and steadfast. The examples within that book of Acts, when everyone that obeyed the gospel, they obeyed it the exact same way. They heard it. They believed it. They repented. They confessed. They were immersed. They rose to walk in the of life. Did they all stick with it? No, sir. Why not? They decided man might be right about something. And they followed the pernicious ways and died in their sins because they thought more of the praise of man than they did the glory of God. Preacher, you ever know anyone that that's happened to? You don't have time for me to read that list. I've not only got a lot of friends that have left Christ. I've got family. We ever try to get them back? Every day I live. Some of those people refuse to listen to anything more I have to say. They return my mail. They block my emails. They block my Facebook and me from them and and always. If I knock on their door, knowing they're home, they won't answer it. I try calling, and if they've got caller ID, they won't answer. If they don't have caller ID and they find out it's me, they hang up. Why? Paul explained it by saying they have a conscience seared with a hot iron. You cannot and you will not ever penetrate them again. They don't want it to be of God. I have a question for people like that. If it is not of God, what judges you? If it is not of God, what supports you? If it's not of God, what condemns you? Now, when you think those things through, folks, you'll see that man cannot help your soul. Man's thoughts are not God's. Man's ways are not God's. Man's thoughts are not God's. Only God can save your soul. He told you how, told you when, told you where, told you why. Don't argue with it. Preacher, I don't like it. You better change your mind. Because to tell God no is to have God eventually say to you, you can't come where I am. Where's that, heaven? You want proof of that? I hope you don't have to attend any funerals very soon, but I suspect some of you will. You ever have to go to a funeral where you knew that the individual that died never obeyed the gospel, never had any desire to obey the gospel, fought against it with all his might, died that way, 
defying God, knowing the truth, and still not obeying. You ever know anybody die that way? I had a preacher friend down in southeastern Ohio that was asked to preach a funeral of a man that he labeled as the most wicked man that ever lived in that particular county. But his family called him when he died, and they said, we need you to preach Dad's funeral. That preacher said to that family, there is no way I can preach his funeral. He says, I, I can't think of anything kind, anything loving, anything decent about your dad. He said, you, know, you kids know what he did to your mother. You know what he did to you. You know what he did to his fellow man. I can't give you any hope for his soul. Here's the statement from that family. We know that. And we know you won't lie about it. And he preached that man's funeral, encouraging the family not to do as that loved one had done. That's a rarity. Most of the time, folks think to get to heaven, all you have to do is die. They don't believe there's a hell because if there's a loving God, he surely would forgive his sins whether he obeyed the gospel or not. No, God is a loving God, all right, but loving on his terms. Well, why his terms, preacher? He created you. Anybody more know more about you than him? He breathed into your nostrils the breath of life. Anybody else give you that? He's the one that gave his only begotten son to die for your sins. Anyone ever come close to doing that for you? Why wouldn't you listen to God? If it be of God, you're not going to stop it. That's why if it be of God, it always strengthens the church. It always strengthens the church. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 2 and beginning at verse 11. And by the way, folks, if you haven't noticed by now, I don't always even follow my own charts. I, a, a friend of mine got me started using PowerPoint a long time ago, and the first time I got all, up a bunch of charts, I tried to put them all into one sermon, and after that was done, Carl came to me and he says, I'm going to take that PowerPoint computer away from you. He says, you can't get a sermon done in under an hour. So <laughs> I just kind of skipped through, you know. If you want the whole charts, I'll give them to you. I, you know, I don't have any charge for that. I don't have a copyright on them. If you want to have them, I can get all of them to you, even the ones I didn't use. What I want you to notice tonight is this. If it's of God, it can't help but strengthen the church, and it's found in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers from the covenants of promise. You had no hope and you were without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. He is our peace, who hath made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, abolishing in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you that were afar off, and to them that were nigh. Through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now therefore you're no more strangers and foreigners, you're fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God. You're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together and groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. It can't help but strengthen the church. And last, look to third chapter, beginning at verse 14. Paul says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus, 
of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, Unto Him be glory in the church. See where that is? Unto Him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. He can't help but strengthen the church. We're the living stones that comprise it. If it be of God, said Gamaliel, you can't overthrow it. You can't fight against it must happily be found to fight against God. I don't know that I'd want to take that challenge. It's my absolute conviction that God doesn't lose. It's my absolute conviction that every time God says something, it is truth. Every time God has predicted something, it comes to pass. His last prophecy regarding the last time of man is that those on the right hand side of Jesus will hear, Come ye blessed of my Father. And those on his left hand side will hear, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. I don't think he lied about that. Why? Because the statement comes from God in whom it is impossible for him to lie. If it's of God, I suggest you obey it right now while we stand and while we sing.